Um, thank you. No, no. Thank, thank, thank you for coming, all of you in ski parkas in the auditorium. Um, uh, I'm very grateful, and um, also all of you um, out there in uh, Maui or <laughs> Evanston, Illinois, or wherever you are, I'm glad you could join us. Um, let me just say a couple of practical things uh, quickly to this audience. Um, well, to everybody, we have um, put readings, recommended readings, and quite a number of them, uh, all of them vetted by myself, and um, it's, they're all on the website. You get to them by scrolling maybe a little counterintuitively down, 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 and you'll come to the Matisse lectures, and there are cues to how you get to the bibliography, or the, whatever you call it, the recommended readings. I've also thrown in a bunch of very good videos um, and also some links to all the major collections of Matisse that you can look at very easily by navigating to them. Um, second thing is don't miss the little exhibition of Matisse prints that you walked right by, maybe not, not looking at, but uh, when you have a chance, have a good slow look at them. They're all, they're your chance, apart from the still life that you know from it last time, they're your chance to look closely at some extremely beautiful and well-made prints. And these were important to Matisse. Um, they were, the show was arranged by Lisa Hodomarski, who knows the material very well. Third thing is, take your cell phone <laughs> and look at it and make sure it's turned off, please. Uh, thanks very much. Um, now, let's get serious. Uh, by the end of the first lecture, um, we um, had said, seen Matisse at um, the age of 35 find places on the Mediterranean coast where his imagination and his genius for color uh, could find free play. He'd arrived in Saint-Tropez in 1904, and he responded right away to the southern light and painted it with an attractive kind of late Impressionist technique. We saw him experiment with dots of color adopted uh, by the so-called neo-Impressionists, but using it was really too laborious and methodical for Matisse. He, after painting a view of the Gulf of Sunset uh, in a mixed technique uh, here with dots and dashes, he took the painting back to Paris and reworked it. Uh, here on the screen you can see uh, a four-foot-wide painting with the title from Baudelaire, Lux, Calme et Volupté. He's rethought that subject. It became an ideal tea party and beach party. Uh, it became a, made a furor in Paris, but it was recognized as a major statement. The pleasure of the imagery would stick with Matisse. Uh, the warm, vibrant light of the Mediterranean coast and the frank joy of nudity. We looked at the extraordinary summer of 1905 when Matisse and Durin worked together in the fishing village of Collioure and let go of the tradition of matching their colors to what they actually saw and experimented with using their own instincts about that instead. In the autumn of that year, Matisse made a scandal in Paris by exhibiting this teeth-rattling painting of his wife and another of his daughter in a kind of kaleidoscope of colors. These got him and his group the nickname Fauve, Wild Beast. But whatever shock these pictures may have had in, in 18, 1905, there were buyers for them. Um, sketches here he, in Collier um, led to this large painting, his only submission to the Independence Exhibition of 1906, entitled the joy of life, le bonheur de vivre, eight feet wide. <coughs> I want us to take a leisurely look at it uh, with a few details, and I'll just be quiet and let you look.
Matisse was imagining an, an ideal state of being for humanity and maybe also for art itself. Old age, sickness, death were banished. And instead, eternal youth and health were there, as well as warmth and community. For Matisse, painting was the perfect way to celebrate that state uh, by design and also uh, by its color. Color that wasn't confined to imitating the world in its true colors, but in extraordinary colors that he could confer on ordinary things. He was free to improvise, free to stir feelings. Colors that could suggest excitement or repose. Impossible colors here glow up and over the people on the left. Uh, at the right, sinuous blue lines suggest tree trunks and branches, and they morph into the edges of the foliage. On a lemon yellow field, figures do what pleases them, singly and in pairs. In the center, smaller, is a group of six women dancing in a circle. The two bigger nudes in the middle are set off from the yellow ground by a perfectly arbitrary red shadows below and green shadows above. They define the cur curving edges of the women's bodies, which have almost no shading and are virtually weightless. They make an aura around each of the figures. Well, this is an earthly paradise with a long history and art that Matisse, Matisse knew very well. In the first lecture, you saw this vision of 10 years before by his friend, the peaceable anarchist Paul Signac, that predicts that after the government is overthrown, a happy, classless, utopian future. And you saw in Matisse's painting the year before that, that imagines a timeless era when nude bathing and tea time could take place together on the last warm rays of the sunset. Matisse referred to this picture as my Arcadia, the unspoiled place of classical antiquity before civilization degraded it. Here, anything goes happily, and in the center, unencumbered by clothes, that dance in a circle that art lovers would recognize, because it's one that was centuries old. With Nicolas Poussin at the top, it's emblematic of the round of the seasons, a circle dance to music played there on the right by Father Time, so lovely while it lasts. With Rubens in the middle there, um, it's a wild celebration of peasant vitality. And at the bottom, William Blake and the Midsummer Night's Dream, the protectors of marriage, watch fairies dance in a circle. Closer to home, Matisse would certainly have seen the Sardana at the top, which was the national dance of Catalonia, and the traditional circle dance that was still performed just over the border in Collioure, he wouldn't have seen the hora, but I'm uh, including these kibbutzim out of respect and remembrance. Matisse assembled the composition out of studies that he had made the summer before in Collioure. What's unusual is that the setting seems to have come first. It grew out of landscape studies, like the sketch on the left uh, that shows an uphill path flanked by trees that are formed by the stabs and flicks of green and blue. Um, in the middle, another study introduces a nude sitting on the ground and behind her a hectic tangle of trees and leaves. The study at the right has a clearing in the woods and the blue sea beyond. It's empty of people but the layout of colors is exactly the one that he keeps and populates in the painting, which is four times wider. 
Then, at the top, in this tiny oil sketch, he maps out the color zones in broad blocks, now including a foreground area with some figures suggested. And then below that, a somewhat more detailed layout, including all the figures. So notice with all of these changes, it's the colors that stay put. We have some figure studies, uh, too. At the far right, you see this young female playing the pipes in a languorous pose. And in the middle, uh, the drawing, uh, a girl stands, uh, one actually standing at the far left in the painting, stretches upward, wearing nothing but a vine of ivy. And the amazing hot reds that he adds behind her in the painting are unnatural, ardent, you know, and joyful. Matisse was making a practice of studying figures in clay and later making bronze casts uh, after them. Uh, in this case, the figure sitting and stretching probably uh, first inspired the drawing and then the one in the painting. But having caused a storm in the previous independence exhibition, Matisse showed this eight-foot-wide painting and his, as his only submission in 1906. It wasn't just ambitious, but it had something new and different, a calm about it, different from the more agitated, broken paint textures of his work before that. Matisse himself had a musical analogy for it. He said, I tried to replace the vibrato with a more responsive, more direct harmony, simple and frank enough to provide me with a restful surface. Well, this was taken as a wrong turn by his mentor and friend, Signac. He came to see it and wrote to a friend, upon a canvas of two and a half meters, he surrounded some strange characters with a line as thick as your thumb, and then he's covered the whole thing with flat, well-defined tints, which, pure though they may be, strike me as disgusting. <laughs> that from his mentor. Others uh, found it laughable, or worse. André Gide thought Matisse's talent was being stifled by his own theory. I want to remind you that the new freedom that Matisse gave to strong colors did not have to correspond with the actual things he painted. That idea wasn't a theory. It was not exactly new either. Uh, two of the heroes of Matisse and the Fauve group were still alive when the, the Fauve were, were young, Van Gogh and Gauguin. Van Gogh amped up his colors for different purposes, to express his own sense of stoical resolve, or his joy at the vitality of the landscape, or the consolation of his own bedroom, all needs of his own. While Gauguin was still working in France, his colors and distorted scale conveyed something of the strangeness of peasant life in Brittany, its quaintness and its superstitions. And Gauguin's younger followers, like Paul Serugier on the upper right, didn't need to sail to Polynesia to uh, apply um, Gauguin's example of strong color to scenes at home. Gauguin, of course, associated freedom of color with a primitive society, as he imagined it in Tahiti, a world of strange hues and flaming sun and warm air and pre-Christian spirituality. Dave dreams of innocence like these around 1910 took even stranger forms uh, when a self-taught painter, Henri Rousseau, could imagine his mistress on a velvet couch dreaming of a, love, of a <coughs> lush jungle Eden for the pleasure of Parisian audiences. Uh, there were mockers, um, but there were a few adventuresome visitors to the exhibition with money. Uh, two were Americans, a lawyer uh, called Leo Stein and his literary sister, Gertrude, who had emigrated to Paris 
with enough family money from the streetcar business in San Francisco to live in a big apartment near Montparnasse. And there at the upper left, the blue arrow points to the Bonheur de Vivre, uh, hanging up high. And then over on the right-hand side, <coughs> the red arrow points to Gertrude Stein herself, painted by Picasso, the painting now at the Met. The Steins had been following Matisse's work, and they uh, <coughs> brought some of the toughest pictures in the previous salon, including this one, the woman with a hat, which Leo at first called an offensive mess. But there it hangs in the middle, bumping up Picasso's portrait of Gertrude to the next row, uh, one of the great curatorial confrontations ever. <laughs> <laughs> Gertrude, Gertrude's severe, like a high priestess or a sibyl with a mask-like face. Amélie Matisse, dressed to kill, weighed down by fashion with a dubious expression. Picasso didn't often comment on his paintings, <coughs> uh, but when somebody complained that Gertrude didn't actually look like his portrait of her, he said, she will. <laughs> <laughs> the Steins' brother Michael and his wife Sarah had arrived in Paris too. Sarah there in the middle had, had an eye and they were buying paintings. A lot of influential artists and writers came to the Steins' apartments, including the 24-year-old Spanish emigre Picasso, who had not only painted the formidable Gertrude, but also drew her inscrutable brother Leo, that little drawing in the middle. Uh, in March 1906, the Steins escorted Mastis uh, to Picasso's ramshackle studio in Montmartre, probably to look at his portrait of Gertrude. He and they had seen Matisse's Joy of Life painting in the independent exhibition uh, and others in dealer's exhibitions. There actually were several of those, by the way, since a few dealers were catching on to Matisse and even buy buying blocks of his work outright on spec for prices that were a tiny fraction of what bigger names like Monet were getting at the same time. Matisse and Picasso recognized each other's power and originality. Picasso was 12 years younger. He was an immigrant, brilliant, fearless bohemian. Matisse was a solid, fastidious, inward, worried, middle-class citizen. But Matisse and Picasso had begun a long, friendly rivalry that you'll be hearing more about. Well, Matisse's ambition and his blazing originality attracted another avid foreign collector by the name of Sergei Fischukin, who'd been buying Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings for 10 years and taking them back to his 18th century palace in Moscow, where he had the custom of opening the rooms to the public once a week, helping Shukin to decorate his vast walls uh, became a vital source of encouragement and income for Matisse. We'll get back to him in a minute. But Shukin had some competition from two remarkable sisters, people the Steins had known in Baltimore, Dr. Clarabel and Miss Etta Cohn. Now here the Cohns are in Italy with Gertrude a few years earlier. They made trips to Paris, they followed avant-garde developments, and with encouragement uh, from the Steins, they became astute collectors, especially of Picasso and Matisse. And they were not timid. The picture here is one that the Steins had bought and later sold to the Cohn sisters, who brought it back to Baltimore, where it's been ever since, part of the Cohn's gift to the Baltimore Museum of Art. Matisse uh, had taken a trip to Algeria after painting the Bonheur de Vivre. And in the next year, he exhibited this astonishing, almost life-size nude at the Independence Exhibition in 1907. 
This is the picture that made a scandal in the Armory Show of 1913 in America, first in New York, and then especially in Chicago, where Matisse's paintings uh, were burned in effigy by art students. In the Baltimore Museum, it's shown near this statue by Matisse, <coughs> originally a study in clay that he later had cast in bronze. It isn't clear whether the statue came before or after or during the process of painting the blue nude. But in any case, the model was his wife, Amélie, uh, in the studio. <coughs> the exotic flavor is accentuated by the palms behind her in the background, and the title, Memory of Biskra, alluding to an oasis that Matisse traveled to see in Algeria. He developed this complex pose from one end he just used in the Bonheur de Vivre, uh, twisting and stretching, and I think ultimately derived from a classical source, the famous Hellenistic sleeping Ariadne. But Matisse's woman is waking up, and so he gave it the name Aurora, goddess of dawn. Let's just go back now for a moment to this picture. After the sensation of the spring exhibition with this picture and his purchase by the Steins, Matisse returned to Collure and to the subjects that met his needs for joy and ease. His most important works in the next couple of years are small groups of nude figures, mostly female, inhabiting a kind of pre-classical paradise. Matisse imagines them taking pleasure in bathing and music and dancing and games. Nude figures let him explore other enigmatic, unfamiliar situations. Here, a sketchy little pastoral on a hill above the village with a fawn playing pipes for two unclothed women and a child. It's a world where predatory men and, or fawns appear to, and disappear and disturb the peace, but not often. Here's the brutish satyr about to attack a sleeping girl, a nymph. There's nothing to locate them anywhere in particular, just the sparest suggestion of a landscape. Now, the subject of the picture on the right is still an enigma. Three life-size women on an enormous canvas with the merest bands of green and blue to evoke a place by the sea, they're strangely elongated and somehow forlorn. They cast no shadows. They seem to have no weight. The painting impressed Shushukin, and he wanted to buy it, but it had already been sold to a German collector, so Matisse painted the picture on the left, the game of bowls, these three women on the right are doing something with a turtle that, to my knowledge, nobody has explained. <laughs> but writers keep trying. Um, there's a little statue here by Matisse's friend, Mayo, because he might have seen it in the studio. Uh, but it's unfortunately just as mysterious as the painting. His new friend and rival, Picasso, had painted something even stranger during the previous summer. Probably provoked by seeing Matisse's vision of an earthly paradise, Picasso painted something like the opposite, a kind of hell. The workforce of a brothel, some of the very large workers with faces like grotesque tribal masks, a scene painted with a f in a fractured style that's just as audacious as the subject. Picasso didn't exhibit it for 10 more years. It stayed in the studio. But the word got around quickly in the meantime, and you had to go to his studio to see it. And in fact, a lot of people did, and it seems that Matisse did just that in the autumn of 1907. He may well have seen this by 
Picasso too, the same size uh, of, as Matisse's own notorious blue nude, but looking like a parody of it. Now, I'm talking about this, the blue nude, and Picasso's quite likely answer to it looks like, as I said, a parody because the woman is rotated from lying down to standing. In any case, the Steins bought both pictures and hung them in the same room, as though the apartment were a kind of neutral zone in the emerging struggle between pro-Matisse and pro-Picasso fa factions. Shortly, Picasso moved on to create a new race of naked women, massively muscular, bronzed, with very different kind of energy and a new kind of fractured space. This path Matisse chose not to follow, despite its appeal for the Russian collector Shushukin, who bought both of these. They, this may be a good moment to <coughs> recall what was going on in the Brock and Picasso camp during the next few years, that is, the emergence of Cubism. George Brock, on the right, was painting landscapes in the summer of 1907 in the Mediterranean hills in a colorful but mild style based on Matisse. And the next summer, he began to do something much more radical uh, there on the left. Uh, now the viewpoint is closer to the village and tightly cropped on all sides. The buildings seemed jungled together, and there's some confusion in the geometry of the roofs and other places, he's assembled a picture that doesn't resolve into a credible view. The ambiguities in the <coughs> Brock's picture on the left are entirely intentional. He uses tan and green and gray, but not the actual red of the tile roofs. The colors are abstracted, in other words, the way the buildings are. Brock said that he and Picasso were roped together, roped together like mountain climbers, changing lead as they ascended. They were climbing a route, however, pioneered by Cezanne, exploring geometry in the landscape and in most other things that they painted, including and especially still life. Picasso painted this red one in overheated Fauve colors, maybe impressed by Matisse. It was another picture that their mutual patron, Shukin, bought and took to Moscow. And soon, Picasso was using an abstemious range of tans and grays and abstracting the objects to become nearly unrecognizable. By then, his figures were also broken into unstable planes that you, the viewer, had to work to put together. Young artists like Juan Gris in the middle were learning cubist techniques and creating systems of their own. Here is uh, Gris's homage to his master and friend. Picasso's coterie was national, international and it grew quite large and Matisse stood aloof from it, but gradually began to experiment with some cubist ideas and techniques. Then, as we're gonna see in the next lecture, he stopped. Back to Matisse in 1908. His summer stay at Collure was broken by a trip to Tuscany and to Venice. He stayed with the Steins in Florence, and he had his first encounter with Giotto and Botticelli and other Renaissance pa painters. He was impressed and moved. Now in Florence, it's sure that he met this life-sized Venus, born of the sea, and quite likely had her in mind when he experimented again with his own race of women, women enjoying luxury. The painting's called Le Luxe. People in a, again, a primal state of existence. His Venus, Matisse's, is having her feet dried and about to get a bouquet from a nude maiden who's in a hurry to render homage to her. In the distance, the hills of the Mediterranean coast around Collure. 
You can see that there are two versions of the comp composition. The full-size sketch in the middle, done with oil paint, and the other drawn in a fine outline evoking Greece, uh, Greek uh, vase painting and um, executed with a glue-based medium in order to get a matte surface in imitation of the Italian masters that he'd been studying. Friends of Matisse who bought this little nude remember it this way. We had come across a strange little canvas, something gripping, unheard of, frighteningly new, something that very nearly frightened the artist himself. On a harsh pink background, flaming against a dark blue shadows, was the seated figure of a violet-covered woman. We stared at her, stupefied, all four of us. It only made sense once you stopped trying to read it as a nude, but instead felt from the patchwork of colors sensations of dazzling light heat and shade. Matisse said about it, you see, I wasn't just trying to paint a woman, I wanted to paint my overall impression of the South. In 1908, <coughs> Picasso, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Matisse <coughs> agreed with some admirers to teach in a new small private academy for aspiring artists who for some reason didn't suit the official system or vice versa. They uh, rented space in a disused convent and during uh, three years it operated, it moved a few times and had altogether about a hundred students, some French but most of them foreign, including some Americans. Matisse uh, got a very large studio in the deal uh, for his projects. And these included some portraits. Matisse could revive his sort of renegade color sense if he had the subjects to call for it. And we don't know who this young woman was, possibly one of the students in his classes, but she provoked Matisse to give her a hypnotic portrait. In the studio with paintings propped up behind her, big ceramic pots on the shelf above, plus a plaster torso. I suspect her exaggerated proportions and slightly comical costume may have been a kind of art student fashion. Another portrait sitter was a young German sculptor, Greta Moll, who was studying with Matisse with her painter's husband, Oscar. She'd had her painted her portrait painted recently by her earlier teacher in Berlin, Louis Corinth, and she showed Matisse a photograph of it. He told her uh, he thought she could do better uh, for, for, a, for a fee of a thousand francs, which was $200 for Matisse. Greta sat for him 10 sessions, three hours each. It took him that much to get it, to get it right. And what was the struggle about? Later, uh, he said he was trying to give Greta the grandeur of a portrait of similar character in the Louvre. And it's this one, we believe. A portrait that had arms and a pose that would be the court key to his portrait of Greta, but, as he said, was nearly completely discouraged by not capturing the statuesque quality he was after. Who did better, do you think? <laughs> Great Amal by Matisse or Great Amal by Lois Corinth? It, it's as though uh, Greta had shed all that she had been before. Um, the elaborate day dress, the bonnet, the buds and blossoms behind her of her girlhood the slight uncertainty of her eyebrows, all, I think, beautiful and sympathetic. Matisse uh, painted a different Gretel, a fort forthright, uh, whoopsie, back, 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 um, f forthright with her, her f face unflattered, dignified, 
assured and holding her own in front of a fabric behind her with a tremendous blue pattern. I mentioned the new, much larger studio that Matisse now had. Uh, he was going to need it because he'd arranged with his dealer that he could paint large so-called decorations without commission for Shukin's palace in Moscow. And he'd gotten the okay from the client for another large pair of images from an imaginary golden age. The first one shows a round day dance of naked girls that you can see was a reprise of the dance we saw before in the distance. The first version, for one reason or another, didn't suit Shukin's need. So he did it over again, first in a charcoal drawing that you see on the right, and then on a bigger canvas that would suit the space in his owner's palace. The second one is not only bigger, it's got figures as well oh, that are over life size, but it gets extra energy and strangeness from the orangey red skins set against the green and blue of the earth and the sky stripped to their simplest. Shukin had agreed to buy the dance painting, this one, and its companion piece, Music. But when he saw them together in an exhibition in Paris and read some of the mocking criticism, he was alarmed to realize that he'd be putting 10 giant, naked, red-skinned, primitive humans on the walls of his house that he'd been opening regularly to the public, including children. So he canceled the deal. But people spoke in Matisse's favor, and he came around. The second painting may be, may be even, even stranger than the first, um, the music. The very tall woman personifying music plays a, a tiny violin that Matisse imagines as a pochette, the kind that are used in ballet rehearsals. A boy plays the pipes, and three men with open mouths are sitting and singing. This is Matisse's vision of humans as artists of the senses, that he's imagined a time before history. They're Matisse's nameless ancestors, and I think Shushukin's. As you've heard, Matisse was keenly aware of Picasso and Braque and Cubism and the exploration of structure in painting. Cubism was about geometry, about the relation of forms, balance, the logical development of pictorial ideas. That was not for him, not for Matisse. For him, color was fundamental. So listen to him explain. My picture, La Musique, was composed with a fine blue for the sky, the bluest of blues. The surface was colored to saturation, to the point where blue, the idea of absolute blue, was conclusively present. A bright green for the earth and the vibrant vermilion for the bodies. With these three colors, I had my harmony of light and also purity of tone. But Matisse doesn't ignore form. He explains, notice that the color was proportionate to the form. Form was modified according to the interaction of neighboring colors. The impression came from the colored surface, which struck the spectator as a whole. I might add, um, form in the music painting is five figures spaced at equal intervals, like musical notes on a staff. It implied unity, five separate voices making one. And that unity is the counterpart to the whirling circle of connected beings in the dance. As for the systematic development ideas of ideas that the cubist circle practiced, Matisse, you hear, operates differently. And he responded to his own emotions, whether looking at potential subjects in front of them or looking again at his own paintings, finished or unfinished. He described this. He said, 
I'm simply conscious of the forces I'm using, and I'm driven on by an idea that I really only grasp as it grows with the picture. As for the Cubists deconstructing and reconstructing form, Matisse could only proceed differently, intuitively, in fits and starts, forward and back, comparing, correcting, fixing up, or discarding according to what he felt. And as he looked at his own work, now that's why Greta Mole had to endure 10 three-hour sittings. It was Matisse's idea from the beginning that Shukinj would get three paintings, the dance, the music, and a scene of bathers, which he described as, quote, a scene of repose, some people reclining on the grass, chatting or daydreaming. He sent this little composition sketch uh, to his client, but he didn't hear anything more. Matisse was keen enough, though, on the third picture to buy and stretch a canvas of the same enormous dimensions and start work on it. We will come back to that. The dance and music paintings made a deep impression on artists and critics who saw them in Paris before they left for Moscow. And the 27,000 francs that Shushukin paid for them finally stabilized Matisse's finances. Now, you see the dance hanging over the door. Uh, on the left-hand wall, you see an arrow, a red arrow, another pointing to another picture that Shushukin had bought just two years earlier. And it's a long leap for Matisse. The harmony in red... Remember that a, a decade earlier, at the age of 27, he uh, exhibited another large still life in a show organized by artists, this first major work of Matisse's, which made a stir when some of the critics found it too impressionist. Matisse returned to the subject, you might say, with a vengeance. He's displaying his belief in the color uh, and pattern. Now, the Harmony in Red began life under the title Harmony in Blue, when Shishukin bought it that way. But then Matisse wasn't satisfied with it, and he repainted everything that had been blue, and that was most of the picture, with bright red. <laughs> the red tablecloth was an enormous 18th century floral pattern. I'm giving you a sample of that kind of stuff, the so-called toile de juillet. That uh, uh, pattern is a fantasy based on real cloth. Uh, you saw another one, actually, behind Greta Mole. Uh, one of the many fabric pieces that Matisse had been collecting. And so is the wallpaper that's identical to the tablecloth in pattern and size. So this collapses the illusion of, of depth. Uh, but the chair and window are a nod to the fiction that you might walk in and sit down or look out. The still life objects keep their natural colors, though, and their believable placement, more or less. And the fruit seems to wander across the table uh, in a way that still life tradition dictates, while the maid puts things in order. The trees outside are now just white shapes. The printed vines and baskets and flowers on the wall and table look more real than the real ones. Again, Matisse declares his independence from imitation. He relieves colors from their traditional descriptive role, and he gives them a different job to embody his own feelings about what he's looking at. He explained why he made the change from blue to red. <laughs> He said, it seemed insufficiently decorative to me, and I could do nothing else but to go back to it, something that I'm pleased with today. And somebody protested that it was virtually a different picture now. He said, there is no difference. It is forces that I'm concerned with, and the balance of forces. So it wasn't just a matter of color. It was a matter of forms that could live independently in his work, and interact with one another, as the colors did. And as for picture space, 
It's lost its traditional job of being a fictional but convincing stage and made it an express, expressive actor in itself. So all of this he explores for the rest of his career, but with particular intensity during this decade, the decade of the teens. In the summer of 1909, Matisse and his family of five moved to a large, comfortable house in the southwestern suburbs, away from the pressures he felt in the city. There was a garden in back and a yard with enough room for a big studio that he had built by a company that made prefab structures. There, he could make new work and also surround himself with a changing display of his paintings and sculptures. And this studio turned into another kind of paradise for Matisse. In the house on the left, there was a kind of high bourgeois comfort in the ab uh, uh, abundance of textiles from Africa and the Middle East, figured tiles, carpets, wallpaper, patterns on patterns. The odd perspective lets us see all that and observe the games of Pierre and Jean, aged 12 and 13, and notice the polite distance between the artist's wife, Amélie, at the left, and Matisse's 17-year-old daughter, Marguerite, in ladylike black. The studio on the right here, the studio was big enough to be reconfigured over and over with mirrors and screens and other ways to display textiles. Perspective for Matisse was a matter of convenience, artistic license. And he could invent new elements of decor, things that were never there in real life, like the five dotted blue flowers all over the floor that he had again on the wall in the paintings. Matisse didn't however, make up the idea uh, of painting well-to-do people in rooms well upholstered with patterned fabric. Cezanne included wallpapers oops, and, hang on a second here, go back here. Yeah, Cezanne included uh, rugs and wallpaper and printed fabric in the, as the visual equivalent of music. Vuillard made a game, even a career out of it, producing one unlikely fabric to another, uh, often just for the surprise and the pleasure of it, just as Matisse did here, but in a broader style, with fruits and flowers thrown in among the competing patterns. Matisse encountered lavish patterns and arbitrary picture space in painted miniatures by Persian artists of four and five hundred years earlier. And when he traveled to an exhibition in Munich, uh, he was impressed to find out how these painters could acknowledge three dimensions by overlapping planes, but ignore other elements of perspective like diminishing scale and atmosphere and make pictures in a kind of parallel universe to contemporary Western traditions of illusion, and tell the stories with brilliant color and refined detail. In this uh, combination, comp uh, composition of the studio, we've got a wider angle view. The display of his work emphasizes nudes in all media, but it's the pattern fabrics that he puts in stage center. The rose-colored floor and the blue walls were the actual color of the studio, and that was also true in this famous picture of the studio before Matisse decided to overpaint the floor and the walls in red, just as he'd done with the harmony in red that you saw before. The picture amounts to another little exhibition of earlier work, uh, of which Matisse himself had been the curator. Um, on the table to the left, and under our noses, is a still life of drawing implements and one of the painted plates that he'd begun to make together with the ceramicist, André Mettet. 
Next to it is a green glass vase with an arabesque of nasturtium winding around a little terracotta nude statue of his own. The perspective of the tablecloth directs our eye towards another series of paintings on the wall, not just on the wall, a large reclining nude propped up next to the door, and around to the right a bunch of small pictures and frames on the floor, and on the wall a miscellany of paintings from a few years earlier. Heaven for the artist. There are two small statuettes at the right and above them the looks again, whose red skin was part of Matisse's campaign of repaint of the walls and the floors. There's furniture in the room, but it's indicated by the merest outlines in yellow. To give you an idea of what the first version must have looked like before Matisse completely repainted the table and floors and walls a uniform red, uh, the MoMA conservators uh, who worked towards this wonderful exhibition that many of you saw at the Museum of Modern Art a year or so ago, a detail they made digitally from x-rays and analyses of Manisse, uh, Matisse's uh, paint layers. You see at the top a bit of blue wall, pink floor below, and an ochre tablecloth. So try to imagine that. What looks real in the studio uh, is the work. The rest is a kind of dream for Matisse, who lived for his work. The place has become a paradise as well as a home. You can understand the painting better, uh, by the way, through the wonderful uh, catalog of a couple of years ago uh, done by Momo for the show I mentioned. It's still in print, and it's worth having. In 1911 and 1912, Matisse and his wife spent much of the winter in Morocco, uh, making some paintings to bring home and drawings to work up later. One of them is a view out his window in Tangier with a still life on the ledge in front and outside uh, some patches of sandy ground with a few people on it. And beyond that, several great landmarks. In the distance, the Kasbah and closer to the Episcopal Church of St. Andrew. I mean, all of it seems to float, even these buildings, on masses of shadowed trees on blue, barely differentiated blue, with a sea on the horizon. Most of the picture was Matisse's recollection, painted back in France. And you'll recognize its place in a series of views out windows. Ah, wait. Thank you. A series of views out windows and doors that started long before in Brittany, and Picardy, and then on the Mediterranean coast, each with a different emotional charge of longing, regret, and pleasure. He found Moroccans to model for him. He put them in settings that are semi-abstract and painted them nearly life-size, frontally, to make the most of their costumes and their confident repose. The woman here has taken off her slippers, and she just sits with folded legs covered by her patterned kaftan and looks at us. Or she may be looking at the glass bowl and the three goldfish, the only things in the pictures that move. Or The goldfish bowl has was a motif that Matisse drew from live observation in Tangier. He used it in the most radical composition to come out of his time in Morocco. This seven foot wide picture. He gives it a border like a carpet. And at the top, an arcade to suggest that it's a place in the city. He has the coffee house customers sitting or lying comfortably, faces blank, wearing identical jalabas and turbans. Well, downstairs, uh, down, uh, downstage here, two of them occupy their leisure by watching goldfish in another elegant bowl placed next to a vase with flowers. We suppose this isn't a private place like the terrace where the woman was sitting, but a public place where one could have a kind of informal 
meditative practice, these Moroccans in Matisse's imagination have found their own paradise, untroubled by work, detached from necessities, kind of weightless in their world, the way fish are in theirs. Or, I suggest, music makers of prehistory are. These two paintings hang in the same room at the Hermitage, where I hope one day we can all go to test that suggestion. Matisse was going to find many gently metaphorical uses for goldfish. I want to just look at a few for a minute. Um, back in France, uh, Matisse had a cylindrical goldfish bowl that appears again and again in series of still lifes. Here it sits on his terrace, and he pays a lot of attention to detail here, to the mouths and the googly eyes of the fish, and the optical aspect, the fact that the fish are doubled by their reflection on the surface of the water. They're part of an ensemble of leaves and flowers and furniture, things that exist simply to give pleasure for Matisse to paint as a sort of fine-tuned ensemble for us to enjoy. These fish are in the studio in with other obje objects of fascination for Matisse, the naked female form, a small sculpture next to the table there, and in between the flowers and the vase. The female is a plaster version of one we've seen, uh, the one of four years earlier that Matisse had entitled Aurora, the goddess of dawn, waking and stretching, awakening maybe to the sense pleasures of r vibrant red flowers and fish. And all of that happening in his studio that he imagines as a strange arbitrary space, a wash in a flood of blue, with the door open to the outside. In this painting, there's a similar setup in a completely different mood. The goldfish are there again, hovering, uh, now on a wooden table whose construction he's taken great pains to show you. There's more studio stuff in the room and a different technique with thicker paint and colors that stand out against the densely black background. The scene is familiar, but the treatment is unfamiliar. Matisse moved to a new, a bigger studio in his old building on the Seine two years later. Goldfish again. On the left, next to their bowl, a neglected houseplant that reaches forlornly out and gracefully, however, <laughs> towards the outside. The water brings the blue of the river and the sky into the room. The space inside and the furniture and the window are warped but anchored by two ovals of the fishbowl and another in the foreground. The other painting at the right in the Museum of Modern Art is a tougher puzzle. Matisse's struggle with cubism has begun. We recognize the goldfish bowl and the apple, but we've got some trouble with the rest. Underneath the fishbowl, there's a long-legged table, which is not so clearly indicated. At the top right, there's a web of diagonals. And under that, the artist's workplace, it seems, a table or a ledge, and a painter's palette that has a mysterious finger sticking out of it, <laughs> which is a, a, obviously a, a witty allusion to the mysterious presence of the artist here. But it's also a detail noticed by Picasso uh, Matisse is admired by now in competition, who in response a year later did something similar by including a palette in his wonderful Harlequin painting, uh, which he thought it might be actually his most successful painting, a palette with his own profile portrait. I'm going on about these goldfish pictures because Matisse made them enigmatic on purpose and be because they suggest ideas about sight and observation, what we see, what the painter has seen and turned into 
poetry, using the tools of the trade, color, composition, and the fiction of three-dimensional space. The goldfish see, too, out the curved glass to our world, but we don't know what they see. Anybody, however, who's tried to catch fish with lures knows that fish have remarkably discriminating eyesight. Was Matisse speculating on their confinement in an artificial habitat for our amusement? Was he perhaps thinking about the calm little world within the world of the painter's studio, a kind of microcosm? Matisse said this 30 years later, enraptured by light, I have often mentally abandoned that small space surrounding my motif, which it seems was sufficient for painters of the past, and dreamt of a space beyond myself, beyond all motifs, studios, even houses, a cosmic space in which one feels the walls no more than one does the fish in the sea. This detour began with Moroccans observing goldfish. Um, Matisse returned from Tangier to France with a lot more observations and images. The, one of his major projects was this large assemblage of imagery from Morocco that often, again, adapts some cubist practices to his own. He had been observing the mosques and the markets, as well as um, his coffee shops, uh, and he wrote to his friends to show them what he'd been up to, little, two little drawings on the left, and a view from, uh, which is a view from above down to a market square, and um, the small oil sketch at the top, which has some clues to the shapes on the big canvas, which were at the upper, uh, and you see at the upper left, uh, the, uh, among other things, a dome, um, a, a shrine, a marabout, and uh, to that, he's added in his big painting some more architecture and a railing and the wonderful potted ca cactuses that he rendered with stripes. And down below, the gridded um, pavement uh, has some market goods, melons laid out in green foliage, making a composition of circles that picks up the circular cactuses and the head of the turbaned man, pulling the composition together. One striking thing is the amount of black, which covers many campaigns of scraping and repainting, usual for, as usual for Mat Matisse, especially at this period of constant experiment. Twenty-two years.